Yes, hello, good afternoon. Thank you very much for being still awake and being interested in our story, in the German perspectives, as it says in the book, in the program. So now you are hearing a third perspective on, yeah, on what? On what you just heard by Annette saying, Vergangenheitsbewältigung. I think you can only grasp the real sense of this term if you are actually German and understand the notion of German suffering in this world. Vergangenheitsbewältigung, dealing with the past, we just said, coming to terms with the past, of course, it is insinuated that you never, ever really come to terms with this past. Six million slaughtered Jews, not mentioning all the other victim groups. What can you say? What can you do? What can we do? What have we done? The first of all that I want to mention here is that I think Germans, as a society and as individuals, feel a very, very strong ambiguity in themselves. They were torn apart between perpetratorship and being a victim. When I look at my family, for example, my mother's father was a member of the SS and he was killed in 1943 by the Union Nazis. My father's father was a German judge and he was suspended from office in 43 because he was too Catholic for the Nazi party. So there you are. In my family, Sides, perpetrator of the worst kind, SS member. And on the other hand, part of the German elite as a judge, sure, and to survive the war, he wasn't persecuted in that, in, that, in that sense, but he was driven out of office because of his conviction of his religion. So this ambiguity shows in each family in in the German society, and of course, necessarily so, I would say, it also shows in the society and in politics as such. And it's even absurd when you look at the different institutions that developed in the aftermath of this Second World War. You had, and this was indeed one of the first laws that were passed by the German parliament in 1949, an agency which is in German called Zentrale Rechtsschutzstelle, a central agency for legal aid. It was first situated within the German Department of Justice, Federal Department of Justice, and later on, it was part of the Foreign Office. And its sort of primary aim was to help prisoners of war who were still in France, in the United States, in Russia. But what it also did, it warned German alleged war criminals if there be prosecution against them going on in France or in, or in, in, in some other country, so that they didn't go and travel to these countries because they'd be arrested. So it actively warned criminals for being prosecuted. And then in 1958, an agency was founded, which was also already mentioned, another zentrale Stelle in Ludwigsburg. So that was quite to the contrary, a central agency for the investigation of former Nazi crimes. So you have two agencies at the end of the day working on Nazi crimes and the one in favor of prosecution <coughs> and the other against prosecution. So this is totally irrational and you can see in the files many, many um, in many instances, that these agencies indeed conflicted in many cases, which is, which is, which is. So there you are, dealing with the past, coming to terms with the past. Ralph Giordano, who, who died last year, uh, Holocaust survivor, he always spoke of the German second guilt, in that Germany did not manage to deal properly with its past. And one of the big failures, indeed, was sort of the continuation of the German elite in Bolivia by the letter. And we've already seen that 
by the, uh, by, by the presentation of, uh, of uh, Mr. Brooks, the disability, inability to prosecute Nazi crimes properly. So the former elite took over again after the foundation of the former Republic of Germany. And there was one, one thing that sort of combined this former West Germany elite, and that was anti-communism. Obviously, also in the United States, you are familiar with that phenomenon. And also in West Germany, this worked almost as a superhero. So never mind what you did in the past, as long as you're now a decent anti-communist, we can use you for our government. And be aware that the Cold War was right within Germany separating West from East. So, so this part of dealing with the past is very much also a German, German history. So at the end, at around 70 to 80 percent of former lawyers who were infiltrated in the Nazi regime were taken on to serve for the new government in the States or on the federal level. I myself have undergone, undergone, undergone a study on the Federal Department of, uh, of Justice, the uh, was just alluded uh, to that, and there we found at the end of the 1950s a percentage of 77 former Nazi party members who were then working for the Federal Department of Justice in Poland. Indeed, no judge, and only one prosecutor, was actually convicted for his former infiltration into the Nazi system by a federal German court. So this obviously was a stern discontinuation of what was started by the jurist trial here in Nuremberg, by this US American military tribunal, where it clearly said that these unjust judgments that were passed, these terror judgments that were passed, were crimes against humanity. This indeed was stopped, was discontinued by the federal uh, German jurisprudence as soon as the Federal Republic of Germany was founded. Council, the Control Council Law Number 10 was not applied, and indeed it was then abolished in, 19, in 1956. And what developed instead were exculpatory myths, if, if you wish to say it like that. And I would identify four reasons, in particular for these jurors, that helped them to you know, stabilize themselves and to minimize their own responsibility. They would say, oh, we only applied the laws. So it's a very positivist argument saying it's not my responsibility, some lawmaker, whether that was, maybe it was out of the globe. I only applied what was said, and what was published, and in the sense. And then the second uh, stream of argument is, oh, I only follow orders. So it's not, again, my responsibility, of my superior. And the third round, in particular these jurists working for the government says constantly, oh, I stayed in office in order to prevent a real Nazi from stepping in on my place. And then, and this is the fourth point, by doing this, I prevented worth from happening. Now I wonder, again looking at six million slaughtered Jews, what on earth could have been worse than what actually did happen? So, these are the four myths that developed indeed in the immediate aftermath of the tourist trial here in Nuremberg, fostered by the Heidelberger Kreis also, which uh, Annette Weike has already mentioned earlier. So by looking at at many biographies of, of lawyers of that time. Of course, I always ask myself, being a lawyer myself, how would I have acted? How would I have reacted under these circumstances? And what I found most intriguing when I look at the stories of these, these people, and you can see that sort of sense that in this great movie, Judgment and Moon, and that's the problem of excessive compromising. 
it's a UI office, and you find a new load on your client, and you get an order and so forth. And you, and you think to yourself, okay, that's a stern reaction, but okay, I'll, I'll do that for that one time. So you compromise. And you compromise once, you compromise as the <coughs> kind of compromise was for the second time, and uh, before you turn around, you've got blood on your hand. So what I think that we learn from the Jewish trial from London is that we have to be aware and we have to shape our consciousness for human dignity and for human rights. This is why we remember what happened. And this is why I do this research, to make us, myself, aware of this fine line and of human dignity as being the overall aim of every law and respect for human rights of every governmental power that is. Thank you very much.